Hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is part 30 of what if Deku had a vampire quirk. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 31 of it, comment down below and let me know. Also check out previous parts of this what if. I have created a playlist for this what if where you can find all the previous parts, link is in the description. Then go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel. Before we start please do support for more awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like and also share this video with your friends. So let's start this video. His world was darkness and blood. Crimson colored life fluid and all encompassing unknown darkness, the likes of which could induce madness upon even the most strong willed of men. Was he traveling through the waters of the Styx? Had he reached the circle of Samsara and his path was one that led to damnation? His breathing seemed to not bring any oxygen into his lungs, but at this current state it was like that didn't matter. And then, it began to echo. A specific rhythm that was similar to many, yet unlike any, it was the familiar tune of his beating heart, of the blood that ran in his veins, feeding his body, unquestioningly obeying his will. The song of life and death. His song of life and death. The vampire wondered how he had managed to get this deep inside his own mind. He was previously waiting in his room for the escort of the police back to his plane, where he would be constantly under the supervision of agents until they set foot back in Japan, where most likely Aizawa sensei would be waiting for him, eyes ready just in case his temper flared up. He could already see it, the bothered and pissed off expression of his homeroom teacher glaring at him for this. You could understand how it could be difficult to enter the Zen state and meditate during such trying times. However, it was rather clear that Izuku was not in his room per se. His physical body was probably there, but his mind was turned deep inside himself. His surroundings began to change as his lucidity took control, and soon Izuku found himself in the ballroom that was the previously innermost party had access in his mind. More portraits decorated the walls, the new additions already fully integrated, and at his beckoning call. The incomplete throne was further finished, but that detail was minor when he registered the newest change, which also had to do with the throne. It was a platform that was raised right in the middle of the ballroom, ascending the throne close to the cage that housed the beast within. One might not notice, but the bricks that shaped the walls had changed too, their spiraling patterns also now becoming visible on the polished floor under his feet, their intricate black red cross design leading up to the platform, almost as if blood and shadows were the foundation for this throne. The cage of the inner beast lay open, yet Izuku could still hear the soft snoozing from his wild side coming from within the confines of the cold metal that made the cage. It was a curious matter for him, considering that his urges were always begging for release, for them to be let out of the cage. The opportunity lay ahead of the creature, however, it stayed its rampage for some reason. No, that's not it. It is being restrained by something else. Please growling left the confines of the cage, a womanly chuckle following after it. The vampire narrowed his brows for a moment, but he still opted to check in the situation. Maybe I did go crazy from all the ingested blood. He mused, taking the steps that spiraled around the raised platform and took him to the top of it, close to unfinished throne. He could see it, but at the same time he saw nothing there. It was merely the cage and his instincts, yet it was as if a woman was there, soothing the madness within with a candor-filled touch, akin to that of a mother appeasing her unruly child. Watch out, you little punk. I can still punch you daylights out. It was a mirth-filled voice. Someone unbothered by the seriousness that the situation implied, almost as if all of it was a mere walk in the park. Izuku couldn't help but be curious. What was going on? Oh, the big boss came to speak to you. Better answer fast, but We have the answer already, he needs only grasp the truth that lies beyond. Rebellious lil shit, the feminine voice called. Izuku waited, wondering if something was going to truly happen. The longer he stared at the insides of the cage the longer his tension grew. Was it a trick of his mind? What was going on? You may show yourself now. He spoke loudly. A few moments of silence proceeded until a chuckle echoed once more. Whoa, talk about stiff sounding. No wonder he can restrain you, that is some tight control over the leash. The growl of his tenant sounded for but a moment before it stopped. Speak not as if you were anything greater than a specter, you failed ghost of the past. First, rude. Second, you don't get to sound grand when you can't even get your shit together, kid. I'd like to participate in the conversation happening in my own mind, thank you very much. Izuku's voice warned, his eyes narrowed. His right hand clenched, dark chains rattling inside the cage, while blood tentacles emerged from the walls, ready to ensnare anything inside. Wait, can't he sense me? The feminine voice sounded genuinely surprised. We have yet to fully come to terms with each other. Acknowledgement is far from true acceptance. We become whole on occasions, he senses you, yet for now only I can truly interact with you due to your unique circumstances. Why only me, though? I have yet to find the answer. We might have domain over life, but we are not omnipotent, neither are we without our limits. Izuku growled, annoyed at only being capable of catching whispers from this feminine voice, while hearing his wild side have a full conversation with it, almost as if they had changed identities and he had become the unreasonable wild beast. 
Whatever it was that was happening inside his mind, it had called for him for a reason. None of the previous cork factors had managed something like this, yet after the vampire took an All Might's blood, something had changed. He glanced around the ballroom, his eyes immediately finding the portrait that housed the pro hero's cork factor, but his questions further increased as he laid eyes upon the painting. It was a strange painting, at face value, it was a simple and stylized akin to a vortex that accumulated energy at its center. Yet, different from his many other portraits, the painting seemed to be alive, for lack of a better word. The vortex of energy seemed to be actively moving, gathering power, yet it also seemed to be static. The cork factor was, a cumulative thing, but there was also a hint of something else in there, much like. The vampire blinked, feeling a strange pull from the painting. A muddled strange link, that was trying to establish between him and someone else, but the vampire was hesitant to allow this strange connection to occur. He took his eyes off the painting, returning his gaze to the cage of his tenant. The presence from before was absent, only leaving the inner beast for Zuku to deal with. The teen approached the cage of willpower, observing that his wild side was still peacefully remaining inside without the need of any prompts from him. What is going on? Who was in there? His questions were met with a ridiculing snort from the beast. Master, you know the answer to such a question. You only need to trust yourself more. The vampire teen narrowed his eyes, but remained silent. Why am I here? His question wasn't answered with words. The inner beast merely raised its head and pointed back to the painting. The lack of a spoken answer got the vampire thinking, trying to figure out his current messy state in life. He pondered for a while, circling around the unfinished throne in his musings. Opening his eyes suddenly, Izuku found himself, not so alone in his room anymore. There was a policeman on the floor, the man scrambling to get up, and not seem foolish. Behind him were a group of about five people, all of them wearing police uniforms, and ready to subdue Izuku the second the vampire tried to get out of hand. He tilted his head in a questioning manner, wondering why one of the cops was on the ground. He spooked him there, Midoriya-san. Don't worry, you aren't in trouble. One of the older officers said in a measured tone, his arms crossed over his chest and overlooking the group. Maybe he was the captain of the group, his chest decorated with a fancy set of pins, and the vampire could spot the edges of decorated insignias on his shoulders. Izuku nodded, licking his fangs and standing from his seat on the bed. He moved slowly, trying to still in the officers, that he wouldn't suddenly jump and tear on their necks, going to gather his baggage. Everything that was his was packed, most of the heavy bags containing gifts to me. The group kept their distance from him, content on watching him do the heavy lifting. He avoided using his shadow control, aware that any unauthorized use of his quirk would probably result in a set of quirk suppressing cuffs being slapped on his wrists and a few encouraging nudges to get him to move properly. He would much rather avoid such pain and embarrassment, so the vampire contented with carrying his things by himself. He was escorted to the airport of I Island, counting himself lucky that few people were paying attention to him. Considering the damage and easily allowed invasion of the tech haven, the many scientists, engineers and technicians of the place were busier with damage control and repairs. That was without mentioning those that were worried about the financial situation of the place. It was a worrisome matter, but the shareholders that invested in the place wouldn't necessarily care about what happened, only that their investments weren't paying off. Well, it was a troubling matter, but it was pulling attention away from him, so Izuku didn't put much thought into it. His mind was more worried about Melissa. David had gone through a checkup and was pretty much okay, his lethargy the night before only caused by the drawbacks from the continuous quirk usage of Sam being withdrawn so suddenly. The quirks were almost akin to drugs, so the sudden stop had been a bit shocking to the inventor's system. Nothing that some fluids and bed rest wouldn't solve. Melissa, on the other hand, had been hurt much further. Izuku's intervention and expert use of ambrosia did help heal the damage caused by the metal rod that punctured her chest, but she had lost quite the substantial amount of blood before his arrival, and the damage had been rather close to her heart. The vampire was confident in her recuperation, but it did pain his heart that they wouldn't have a chance to properly say farewell. He ran his tongue over his fangs, the memory of the taste and smell of her blood bringing a wave of dull pleasure to him. He had tasted many blood types, each with their own flavors, but never had he expected corkless blood to be such a delicacy. It was better than anything he had tasted so far, and it took colossal willpower for him to not bite down on Melissa's neck when healing her. Denying us blood honey, what an absurd master. A male should know better than to deny a meal willingly set before him. Shut it. He enforced in his mind, the beast snorting at him before silence reigned in his head. Izuka released a sigh as he boarded the plane, his VIP seat still remaining. The flight was not a long thing, but it certainly felt like so, especially since he his only company during the flight had been the escorting officers, the plane is small one for quick travels. He didn't have the chance to even meet with his classmates, or even check on All Might, immediately being asked to head to his flight. He couldn't even get a word in with David. Still, at the end of the day the vampire figured that it was fine as it was. Better to deal soon with the consequences of his acts, even if they were done for good. 
Heroes weren't supposed to kill. The loss of a life was the said to be the utmost resort, only when all other options had been exhausted, and truly there were no ways out. That was the law and modus operandi written by the QRA and the HPSC. Izuku had blown far past those terms, even before he was a licensed hero. His first kill was excused by Ed Shot taking most of the heat for it and the fact that the Nomu were considered a bioweapon instead of people. Wolfram, even if a criminal, was still a human. The vampire had crossed the threshold that many heroes had never come close to. His arrival was in the late hours of the night, the vampire still being escorted until they met the waiting escort back in Japan that would take over their duties. Eraserhead was promptly waiting for them, his face displaying all his displeasure at having his sleep hours cut into to have to do this escort job. The captain took off ahead to meet with the teacher, the other officers and Izuku heading over at a sedated pace to allow the main figures to hold a conversation. The vampire was dulling his senses, aware that some people in the airport did recognize him, but were avoiding approaching him due to his escorts. No doubt some pictures were already taken and being spread into social media, the speculation machine no doubt already turning to spin wild tales about his escorted arrival. He sighed in frustration, green orbs observing the captain and his homeroom teacher finished their conversation, the officer's team dispersing their formation to follow their commander. Izuku got closer to Aizawa, completely aware of the inquisitive gaze of the man. How are you? Contrary to the vampire's expectations, the hobo-style teacher was checking up on him. Izuku blinked a bit, licking his fangs to allow himself a few seconds to think. I am, fine. It sounded fake even to his own ears. Azawa narrowed his brows a slight bit, but soon returned to his usual face. Midoriya, I think that we have to talk a bit. Izuku nodded, carrying his luggage as the two exited the airport, heading to a taxi. They entered the vehicle, and informed the driver of the location of the vampire's home, the duo sitting on the back, and remaining silent for a while. Izuku stared at the moving cityscape form his side of the window, while Aizawa seemed content with staring at nothing in particular. It was an awkward silence, neither side's too keen on starting a conversation that would no doubt drag on due to its nature. The vampire took a deep breath, checking his phone and sending his mother a message. Might as well do it now, deal with the situation before it goes on for too long. Sensei, are you free this evening? His teacher focused attention on the vampire. I don't have anything planned for tonight. Izuku nodded. Right. His green eyes turned to the screen of his phone, trying to find a way out or a distraction, but failing. He took another deep breath. Would you like to stay for dinner? We need to, settle things. Tell mom about what happened before it goes out of control. The vampire preferred this way. Hiding things from his mother, was never his strength, and while the occasional white lie was all in good, this was an entirely different matter. He had protected, sure, but he had also killed. Azawa nodded, serious eyes settling over the teen as he mused a right answer to this. Sure, I can stay. Izuku nodded once more. The rest of the way was followed in complete silence from the two, their ride taking about two hours until it finally reached the apartment complex that housed to the Midorius. Izuku paid for the cab and grabbed his things, Aizawa watching it silently. Needless to say, Izuku opted to use his muscles instead of shadow tendrils. They knocked on the entrance door, the figure of his mother opening it easing some of the tension that troubled the vampiric teen. Izuku. His lovely mother exclaimed in happiness, hugging his frame without noticing the teacher just behind him. The vampire was more than happy to return the hug, but he did cut it short to point to his teacher. Mom, we have a visitor. The teen pointed out, taking a step back to allow his mother to see the underground hero. Aizawa dipped his head in acknowledgement. Oh my, please forgive my rudeness. I'm Midoriya Inko. Please, do come in. The matriarch apologized in a hurry, doing a half bow, before beckoning the teacher in. The trio entered, Izuku excusing himself to his room to drop his bags, before returning over to the kitchen. Mei wasn't home, but right now that seemed to be the better scenario, as there would be much serious talking to be done, and the mechanic wasn't exactly known for her finesse and social talk. He'd rather explain his situation to her when they were alone than risk the girl throwing a wrench at his homeroom teacher. Or building an improvised mech to attack him. Or a goss rifle. Or any of the many ways the grease monkey gal could use to harm. She had grown not only attached to him, but in many ways, it was like he could do no wrong to her. Aizawa was sitting across Inko's seat, a steaming coffee mug present right in front of him, no doubt courtesy of his mother. She'd always have coffee ready for him, the vampire an avid drinker of the bitter, but satisfying liquid. Nothing would top off blood for him, the coffee no doubt did come as a runner-up. He got himself a mug and sat beside his mother, ready to begin that conversation that would surely extend deep into the night. First things first, Midoriya-san, I would like to apologize to you. We at UA pride ourselves at being able to bloom our students' talents in a safe environment, yet this year a few situations have happened that ran amok and outside of our control, which ended up causing our students some problems. Aizawa raised a hand to scratch at the stretched-out scar that ran under his right eye. 
Midori's class has faced those situations with bravery, and actions worthy of pro heroes, but they are still minors, that are under our tutelage, and for that I apologize. Inko seemed unsure of what to say, opting to sit quietly and let the teacher continue his spiel. She glanced at Izuku, who was focused on the words of his teacher, sparing just a gaze at his mother, before returning his focus to the scarf-wearing man. Once more it seems that Midoriya has found himself in a situation that he should have never been in. His words caused the matriarch of the house to grow a worried restless face. I, Ilan has been attacked by a group of mercenaries, and your son rose to occasion to aid the efforts of All Might. He did excellent work, and saved many lives. As always words of praise felt strange. Izuku wasn't used to hearing praise from his homeroom teacher. Eraser had preferred to pile up tension and work on his students, meaningless words of encouragement seemed to be outside of his repertoire. However, that is not why you have come over to visit, right? The mother asked, her voice tinged in worry. Eraser had nodded. Yue has received word that Izuku not only used his quirk without permission from a pro hero, but has also. The pro underground hero seemed to be hesitant to speak, trying to find the proper words for the matter. The longer his pause extended, the worse Inko's worry seemed to grow. I kill someone. The vampire's voice was stable. It was impressive, the manner in which she presented the fact, almost as if it was an everyday occurrence. There is no use dancing around the issue as always sensei. A mercenary villain attacked I Island searching for an important item, and wanted to score a bonus, by kidnapping Melissa and I. All Might was fighting against him, and in the end, I delivered the killing blow. Izuku opened the can of worms himself, aware that his mother's white orbs were glistening with a moist shine, tears accumulating quickly. Azawa sighed, taking the time to sip from his coffee, to add some energy to his tired body. What Midoriya has said is correct. He has admitted to committing murder, and we have the body of the villain in question in custody, drained of all blood. The teacher's words were the final nail in the coffin for the green-haired mother, the waterworks bursting open silently as tears began streaming down her face. Inko latched onto her son, tightly hugging his right side and whimpering. Izuka wrapped his right arm over her shoulders, and let his mother cry for a few moments. It was the least he could do now, considering he would carry that mark on his records, and her heart, forever now. The situation is under heavy scrutiny and debate. Principal Nezu is, at this very moment, attending a meeting with the president of the HSPC and the QRA to discuss Midoriya's situation and how we can proceed. Let me assure you, Midoriya-san, that we will fight tooth and nail to allow Izuku to continue his studies unhindered by this situation, as the circumstances were dire and extreme, thus did require the use of his quirk. Aizawa's words were filled with conviction, the vampire feeling somewhat surprised that his homeroom teacher seemed to care this much for him. He was not used to this type of thing. The vampire licked his fangs. My Izuku will be arrested. Inko's voice cracked, making the vampire clench his jaw. Eraser had took another sip of his drink. I can't say for certain. Well we can certainly push across the point that his actions were, well harsh, needed to guarantee his safety, the government board and lawyers can try to push the point that his quirk is too dangerous, and they might try to apply some sort of sanction or other heavy punishment that might restrict Izuku too much. We are fighting to get a desirable outcome, but I must warn you to be prepared for anything. It was our luck that I Island's net was restored and retaken before any information could leak out to the public, but it is still a very delicate matter. Izuku nodded, running a soothing hand on his mother's shoulder. Inko tightened the hug. The teacher emptied his mug, glancing at his phone for a few moments, before returning his gaze to the family. I know that Izuku has just returned home, but I'd like to ask that he pack some bags and come with me to UA's campus. The government has put me in charge of maintaining surveillance over him, and it would bolster our arguments if you were to fully comply. It is still within your right to refuse, but I'd ask that you trust me. Izuku looked to his mother, aware that the woman was hurting bad due to this sudden occurrence. The inner beast gave out a low growl in his mind, but it soon opted to remain silent, understanding the situation. Mom, I, need to go. Izuku said in a heavy tone. Inko whimpered once more, the tears even more abundant. It will be fine. Aizawa's sensei and the principal are fighting for me, we can trust them. I. The vampire tried to reassure his mother, but he ran out of words. He was never any good with social norms. Inko hugged him tightly once more, her tears wetting his shirt and jacket. I know sweetie. I understand. It hurt more seeing his mother cry than tanking bullets from railguns. The sensation gnawed on his bones, and his blood both boiled and froze. May I at least, drop him off with you? She questioned the pro-hero, her eyes already puffy and red due to her tears. Azawa nodded. Of course, ma'am. The family excused themselves to pack a bag for the vampire, leaving the teacher waiting in the kitchen. His many gifts to May, and some to the matriarch herself, were placed on the mattress, the hemomancer clenching his fists, still trying to find comforting words to offer to his mother. For a moment the fleeting idea of running away did appear in the teen's mind, but he quickly curbed it. He had done the right thing in his mind, Wolfram needed to be put down for good. 
Besides, there were many more figures in the dark that needed to be exposed. The mercenary was only one of many that hid in the deep recesses of the world. The VHSPC and the QRA decided to blacklist him and void any chances of him getting a hero license. It would be better to not think about it too much for now. Mom. Izuku called out, pointing out to a few of the packaged items in his bags. Please do give these to me. I separated some gifts for you two here. It was thanks to cooling blood that he was managing to remain calm and collected, else he might just break down much like her. His mother hugged him once more, and he offered another round of soothing back rubs. You're the best mom, don't ever doubt it. This will be over before you know it. He tried to put some humor into his voice, but only managed to speak in a stoic tone that bordered on emotionless. Don't worry sweetie. I trust you. I'm sure that you did your best. Inko managed to hold back her sobs and whimpers, packing his bag with all the needed clothing and personal items of the vampire. They left his room and returned to the kitchen, finding Aizawa to be waiting for them while standing up. The group headed to the entrance of the apartment, Inko holding back her sobs, and left the building. They headed to the street, where a car was already waiting for them. Inside the vehicle the vampire found present Mick, to be waiting for them, the radio host surprisingly quiet for once. The blonde offered a head nod to the vampire, content with keeping his eyes on the street, and lightly bobbing his head to a low volume jam that was playing on the radio. Back to the campus, Mick. Aizawa took the front seat next to the driver, the car being turned on and leaving the area in a quiet manner. The trajectory was done in silence, only cut up by the low music, by all the group, the vampire and mother kept their familiar embrace during all the way. Another hour had the group entering the teacher's private parking spot inside the enormous UA campus, the foursome hurrying inside the nearby administrative building. Inside the building, Aizawa remained with the family, while present Mick went deeper inside, no doubt to relay information to whoever needed to know. Izuku and Inko were placed on a waiting lobby, Aizawa giving the family their space, but still keeping within eyesight. He knew that Izuku would not flee, or attack his mother, but others with less insight, and information on the vampire, might take it the wrong way, if the teacher were to allow more than this. It was close to 11pm, when present Mick returned with midnight in tow, the woman kindly smiling to Inko once she got close enough. Izuku stood up from his seat on the couch, bringing his mother with him. You need to head home to rest up, mom. I'll be fine. The Midori matriarch sniffed, trying to control her tears to the best of her ability. I know baby, I know. The female heroine was by his mother's side soon enough, guiding the woman out while the vampire remained behind. Azawa got close to the vampire. Come on, let's get you some rest. Tomorrow you'll have to talk with Hound Dog. After such an experience, it would be best if you unloaded what is in your chest. Izuku nodded, noticing that his heart was not guilt ridden. He certainly wasn't in Cloud 9 after the events in Eye Island, but saving Melissa and David, retrieving the last sample of Ambrosia and killing a threat such as Wolfram, certainly seemed to be net positive actions for the vampire. He let himself be guided to his temporary room, which seemed to be temporary quarters for staff members. It was a common room with a bathroom and a small studio for desk work. Certainly not shabby. Midoriya. Aizawa called out from the door, maintaining his tone equal. I meant what I said to your mother. We can discuss more tomorrow, but know that I stand on your side. Izuka licked his fangs, humming an affirmation to his teacher. Thank you, sensei. The racer had glanced at him for a few more seconds before he left the team to rest up. The teacher went straight to the teacher's lounge, heading to his table and reaching the door of the mini fridge, expertly hidden from common sight. It was full of nutrient packs, melatonin pouches and easy to consume meals, the sight of it would surely give a proper housewife heart palpitations. The teacher ignored all of it in favor of reaching for the hidden small whiskey bottle. He opened the cap and downed the contents in one heartbeat, the small amount going down with a burning sensation in his throat. Kids too young for this shit. He grumbled, grabbing a melatonin pouch and sucking it dry in a moment. This year has been a mess so far. He thought, turning on his computer and opening up his electronic mail. A myriad of messages popped up on the screen, their contents varied between investigation tips, police reports, student reports and many more. It was fairly well organized, not something you would expect from the messy, hobo-looking pro. A new email popped up, the hero immediately opening it. At first he wondered if it was merely spam, considering it was a blank thing, the only thing written on the thing was the URL address to some streaming website. The hero almost ignored it, but decided that he lost nothing watching whatever it was, at worst, it would be nonsense from some random on the internet. How Aizawa wished to be wrong. Kamiko watched with boredom the training of the group of villains, that she found herself associated with. Her presence here was more of a convenience than true desire to commit crimes or lift up the banner of a, so-called league of villains. Honestly, she would rather be back at the gym, since at least there she got to meet new people. No one was as interesting as her Izukai and Erstaini, but they were interesting people nonetheless. Kenchan was such a sweet puppy, always glancing around to try to catch any glimpse of Izukain. Metalhead was a bit boring, always trying to put up a show about manliness, especially if he was close to Kenchan. 
Se-chan was a small-time prankster who was fun to hang around with. There were people that she might have never met, if not for Izukain. He told her to not hurt anyone, no matter how interesting they were, so she would obey. Izukain was the best. She had a room, a nice job and blood to snack on. It wasn't hot and fresh like she acquired before, but so long as she endured a bit the bland taste, Izukain would even let her drink from him once in a while. His blood tasted absolutely divine. So many flavors. So rich and nutritious. Toga smiled dreamily, showing a fanged grin from her seat. What's got you so happy, Toga? A male voice asked. It belonged to a lizard-looking male, who currently was swinging around a ridiculous amalgamation of swords strapped together to make one great sword. The man was clearly inspired by Stain, seeing as his getup was a complete carbon copy of the villain's look. She rolled her eyes at the lizardman, jumping from her seat atop a wooden box, and patting her skirt down, making sure to not give anyone a panty shot. Only Izukain could peek down her skirt. A maiden can't easily share her secrets, Spinner. It is not like you would understand anyway. Toga said dismissingly, waving a hand in a shooing manner. The lizard look like called Spinner clicked his tongue. What's with that attitude? I can understand girls just fine, try me. Kamiko glanced at his frame, from his boots to his hair. She then shook her head exasperated, almost as if she had found a truth only she could see. That seemed to trigger the male, who began stomping on the ground, while shouting and pointing his finger at the girl. Far from the duo on another corner of the spacious room stood a tall man with black hair and blue eyes. There were many patches of skin stitched over his face, no doubt many more under the Cody wore. He watched the duo exchange banter with neutral expression, more content with staying in his corner and clicking his fingers, bluish sparks of fire escaping from his fingers each time they clicked. I sure hope this isn't a waste of time. He muttered, stopping his clicking to run a finger over one of the many patches of stretched out purple skin. It was taut under his delicate and careful touch. He left the comedic duo to their banter, and spied from the corner of his eyes small figure. The person was dressed in what seemed to be a mix between combat armor and a hazmat suit, the gas mask modified with armor, and the whole ensemble was painted black. It sure doesn't seem to be going good if they are resorting to picking up runs. The gas mask wearing person turned to the tall male, staring at him with a pointed gaze. The black haired man returned the intense gaze with a lazy one of his own, but the clicking of his fingers had stopped, the hand previously doing the motion being raised, almost as if he was about to take a drag of a cigarette. A moment of tension rose between the two, but the tension was soon broken by a loud yelp. A man dressed in a black bodysuit with white grey lines and a full face mask was running away from Himiko, the girl's hands doing a grab motion as she ran after him. Let me check under that mask. Toga-chan wants to know if you are cute to look at. Never. You only want to know my identity, you lunatic. You can peek though, since you are cute. Two opposing statements left the man's mouth in two slightly different tones of voice. The man had yet to stop running away from Himiko, but it was clear that they were merely fooling around. The black-haired man lowered his hand, his bored eyes scanning the rest of the room. There were a few more individuals in here, but they all opted to either hide in the shadows or cover up under cloaks, trying their best to remain inconspicuous. Then, the only door of entry to the room opened up, from it a blue-haired man with a bunch of hands around him entered, marching inside with a lanky gait. I wanted more leads, but I guess this much will have to do. That super nomu, that sensei is cooking up better be good. The blue-haired man, the so-called leader of the league murmured, while checking out the room's occupants. The black-haired teen narrowed his eyes. His first interaction with Shigaraki, hadn't been the best. The image he had of the man hadn't improved at all, but since this was a chance to get him closer to his objectives, he would endure the bothersome man-child for now. The moment your usefulness ends, I'll reduce you to ashes. Until then, enjoy your post, Leader Sen. He mused, noticing that Toga had stopped fooling around and focused her acrid eyes on the leader. Not too popular, huh? This might not be such a waste of time then. Listen up, because I hate having to repeat briefings like a goddamn NPC quest giver. I gathered you here since your individual skills are unique, and you all are more or less worthy of being called elites. The League of Villains doesn't need a bunch of ragtag bottom tier trash noobs. You saw the stain gathered under us. You bunch do the same, and we can take those fakes, and turn around this trash society. What kind of half-assed speech is that? You truly believe that crap that you are saying? Wasn't it you bunch that gathered under stain, since you got your asses handed to you by a bunch of kids? Even that bastard is better at motivational crap. You can't even be bothered to try brainwashing, huh? The male with black hair muse, his bored eyes growing dull. Maybe I should just torture you right now, and save myself the trouble. He almost raised his hand up once more, but before he noticed, his limb had been grabbed. Oh, you need to take a shower, Dobby-chan. You stink. Toga said in a nasal tone, as one hand pinched her nose shut, while the other grasped the cuff of his arm, accurately holding the small patch of skin that wasn't grafted. I couldn't sense you getting closer, come on, Dobby-chan, lighten. No, wait. Don't lighten up. Hm, ease up. Yeah, ease up. You are too tense. 
The girl spoke in a happy-go-lucky tone. He relented, easing the tension in his limb. Good boy, she spoke in English, standing at the tip of her feet to pat his head. He was amused by her foolish nonsense, and allowed her to finish up, all the while ignoring the pointed glare of Shigaraki, who continued his speech even now. Dobby felt the small piece of paper expertly placed among his wild hair and relaxed for now. His dull orbs now returning to their bored tone. He smirked to himself, running a hand lazily over his hair, and discreetly placing the hidden paper in his pocket. Good boy, huh? The weekend went by and soon it was Monday. School was an activity once more, classes going by almost like they were crawling. Especially to a certain group that had traveled to the tech marvel that was I Island. Izuku's seat had remained empty today, none of the teachers offering a reason, why when asked by the most curious members of 1A. Todoroki stared at the vacant seat with his stoic eyes, somewhat aware of what Midoriya might be going through, since he himself had been rather thoroughly screened by his own father and some police agents. His interview was short and mostly a formality, as Endeavor took to answering most of the questions and placated the men. Detective Sakechi had also dropped by his home to ask his share of questions. The dual quirk user figured that Yoirozu and Kyoka had gone through the same process as him too. The trio ended up together after school hours, however, instead of visiting a crepe stand, taking a stroll on the market or going to carry it, the trio headed towards the teacher's office room. Momo was the one to knock on the door, the group waiting a few moments before receiving permission to enter. Inside, Eraserhead and Midnight were previously talking, the duo of teachers' focus now being on the students. What do you three need? Their homeroom teacher asked. Kyoka took the chance. Where is Izuku? The bluntness of her question made Momo glance at her friend from the corner of her eye, whereas Shoto merely nodded, eager for answers. Aizawa stared at them for a moment, but his dry gaze did not dissuade the group from their quest. The teacher sighed and grabbed his phone, typing a message and waiting for an answer. Once his phone vibrated, the teacher returned his focus towards his students. Midoriya just finished his latest counseling psyche test session with Hound Dog and is going to be coming to classes tomorrow. Aizawa offered a small nugget of information to the group. Kyoka and Momo seemed relieved at the news, but the youngest Todoroki kept his stare going strong. And what else? There is no way that the HPSC didn't try something. His statement made the teacher take a tired breath. Should have expected Todoroki to be in on the dealing of the higher-ups. Might even ask his father to dig up on the case. Aizawa returned the deadpan stare that Shoto was sending him, but in the end, he relented and sighed out in frustration. Midoriya's punishment, the words made the girls white in their eyes, Todoroki narrowing his orbs. Hasn't been exactly decided. The situation was dire, and we have proof that most of his actions were warranted. His tone did dissuade most of the group's worries, but it still left something in the air. We have been questioned too, but nothing that required us to miss school. Midoriya also hasn't answered his phone the entire weekend. Todoroki pointed out, his tone serious and impassive. He wanted the entire truth and much like a hungry dog, he would not let the bone go until he sank his teeth into the precious marrow inside. If he needs backing or a lawyer, then I can help with that. Me too. There is no reason for him to be facing any sort of overly harsh punishment, Midoriya Sam merely did what needed to be done. The Yoirozu heiress interjected, finally seeing the chance to offer meaningful help. Kyoka didn't speak much, merely nodding along with her friends. The homeroom teacher glanced back to the modern history one, the two exchanging a silent conversation with their eyes before Aizawa returned his eyes to the group. That is, you don't need to worry. He might need to be a bit more careful with his actions now, however, we are doing everything we can to figure out something to aid his situation. The teacher's phone buzzed again, whatever message inside the device making the man sport the tiniest smile. You can meet with him on the entrance gates, he should be waiting for you. That got the group to perk up, immediately excusing themselves to meet up with the vampire. Once the group left the teacher's office, Midnight spoke. Ah, youth. Blazing hearts and spirits worried about a fellow student. How nice. The rated heroine swooned, hands placed on her cheeks as she could. Aizawa rolled his eyes at her behavior, letting the woman keep her foolish act as he stared at the screen of his computer, once more bringing up an internet tab that was playing a muted video. He narrowed his gaze, thankful for once that the HSPC and the QRA were so through in their screening. The screen of his computer was playing a video that had been anonymously posted up and shared among countless platforms. It was an edited piece depicting the events of Hosu, putting emphasis on staying the hero killer as a martyr for the oppressed, and that his killing spree had been nothing more than a desperate act of selflessness aiming to warn society of the fakeness of heroes. Normally such thing, while sparking interest for the public, would be ignored soon enough. The only problem was that the video was also using Izuku's image, highly exaggerating the vampire's actions and slandering him. Worse yet, it compared Izuku to Stain and essentially said that the teen was the second coming of the hero killer, only this time aimed at the innocent people. To try and push this point, the video of Izuku training the Nomu was replayed countless times, essentially being no more than heavy propaganda against the teen. 
the teacher would later have a meeting with Principal Nezu, the two going back and forth trying to use any advantage to help the vampire. It was inevitable, considering that the teen's quirk had been once more updated in the QRA, the higher-ups would now be paying close attention to the teen. Izuku sat on one of the benches close to the entrance gates of Yue, thankful that the school hours were finished, few to none students present in his surroundings. Azawa's sensei had sent him a message asking for him to stay behind and wait. He obeyed, grabbing his headphones from his backpack and appreciating some light rock, taking the chance to also send a few messages, to organize a few personal things. The vampire's beachfront house was finished, Yuraka's father dropping the keys with his mother, considering the vampire's absence and circumstances. He informed the school of matter, aware that it might be better if he were to live on his own now. As things stood, the property was closer to Yue's campus, and in the rare case that his location was leaked, he had better legal grounds to get people off the land. Living on his own, now that would be a strange thing. He was used to being with his mother, and most recently May. The mother and son sometimes jokingly talked about the transition between his life in their apartment, and in the future his life in his own home, but never had he expected that it would happen like this. He had had plans for it, but this sudden shift still felt somewhat jarring to the vampire. Paying for the furnishing, and all the necessary household items had left his savings tighter than he enjoyed, so he might have to dedicate a few nights to his various endeavors, but that was a matter that he could worry about a bit later. Even with the phones covering his ears, Izuku could still sense incoming steps headed towards him. He looked at their source, finding a trio coming towards him. He paused the music and felt a smile split his lips. Once the group was aware that he noticed them, they waved and hurried. Once they were all close enough, the vampire spoke. Hello there. He offered his usual greeting, a rather smug smile decorating his lips. Kyoka, instead of exchanging the usual banter with the hemomancer, led her ear jacks to the talking for her. The extendable earlobe shot towards the vampire, their intent clear. Izuku responded in kind, allowing tiny blood tendrils to shoot from his own earlobes and grab the offending attackers, wrapping around them, and immobilizing the threat. Prick. How about you answer your phone, huh? The rocker exclaimed, her volume louder than what the vampire was used to. He had the decency to look to the side, aware of the reasons for her complaints. He had yet to answer any of the messages that were sent to him from a myriad of his friends. From Tokoyami to Yuraka, there were many worried messages that had yet to be answered by him. He licked his fangs, his smug smile receding into an awkward one. A few troublesome things happened, and I was sort of busy dealing with them. I was going to answer them today. He hoped the excuse would work. He was planning on answering his friend's questions, it was just that he was trying to figure out how to best explain his circumstances. Yoyozu was less aggressive than her friend. She sat by the vampire's side, all her motions measured, and graceful like that of a princess. She raised one hand and slowly placed it against the vampire's left cheek, the warm touch confusing Izuku, as to why was she acting like this. Then, he got his answer as her hand clenched, and she firmly grabbed a hold of his flesh, pulling his cheek with all she could all the while maintaining a passive neutral face and a small smile. Yaharazu Shan. His questioning gaze was ignored, the girl further pulling the vampire's cheek. Midoriya San, it is a lack of manners to not answer your friend's messages. At the very least, you could have sent a simple message that said that you were busy. We were all worried about you. The rich heiress's words resonated with the vampire, the pull on his cheek rather ignorable. It still sent a message though, that he had friends that worried about him. Midoriya. Todoroki called his attention, the stoic gaze of the teen speaking for him. Would you like to come and visit my home? Now that got the vampire widening his green orbs, both in awe and confusion. Calm again. His cheek was still being pulled, and he was still dealing with Kyuka's attack, but the vampire could still spare focus to this rather oddly timed event. I read that spending time with a companion can reduce stress and a home visit invitation is a sign of deep trust and friendship. Shoto said calmly. I haven't had the chance to invite anyone to visit and spend time over. I'd like to invite you. Even the girls were surprised by the sudden invitation of the normally stoic Shoto. Izuku's attackers relented and stopped their pursuit. Now that their anger was sated, they remained by his side. The vampire was thankful, nodding his head to his classmate's sudden, but welcome request. Sure, Todoroki. It will be my pleasure, thank you for the invitation. Izuku said, Shoto nodding along with him. I'll tell my sister, and we can set up dinner. With that been said, Shoto waved at the group. Wait, you are going already. Kyoka commented, rolling one of her jacks on her right indicator finger and playing with it. Todoroki once more nodded. I did relay my invitation and he has accepted, I still need to train home, and he already has you two to keep him company. He assumed a pensive pose. I never expected intimate relationships to work with more than two people, but then again my personal example isn't the best. I suppose that a relationship with more than two lovers can alleviate the worries and mental burdens, but then again it might increase tension between them. Fayumi did try to bring a boyfriend home, but father, Mitsumi too did. Shoto devolved into a mumbling session that would make young Izuku proud. 
the contents were a bit dubious and a little too conspiracy theory-like, but getting Todoroki to speak more than a few lines at a time was already a win in the vampire's book. Kyuka's right eye twitched a bit, the girl's enhanced hearing allowing her to pick up on the nonsense her classmate was saying, but the girl was stunned still at the contents. Before she could intervene and correct Shoto's erroneous thinking, he raised his head. I need go, I have a few questions to ask my sister. Todoroki took off with the rush in his step, Kyuka groaning at the bad misunderstanding. You? She jabbed a finger in the vampire's chest, her jacks raising up and resembling hissing snakes. Why didn't you say something? Izuka raised his hands in surrender. Good luck trying. I recognize a mumble thinker when I see one, denying whatever he thought up right now would only make him grow more suspicious and curious. He will give up on the idea soon enough. Momo innocently tilted her head to the side. What's going on? Kyoko released another groan and leaned her body against Yui Rose's, throwing her hands around the taller girl's neck and hugging her while whining. Always remain this pure, yeah Momo. Izuka relaxed a bit. Whatever he would need to face up, that was for the future. Right now, he enjoyed the moment. Buzz buzzed. Kyuka jumped away from him, landing on Momo's lap. Don't you fucking dare, Izuku. He licked his fangs, letting a small smirk settle over his lips. Whatever do you mean, Jiro Kyoka-sen. He spoke in a drawn-out, lazy tone. He could explain things later, for now this was fine. The next week was a bit hectic for the vampire. Between answering all the messages, studies and some questioning sections with Aizawa, Detective Sakechi and Hound Dog and the usual training, Izuku did manage to get back into the thick of things. He was thankful that things seemed to be kept on the down low when it came regarding his actions on Eye Island, but he was still housed at UA's quarters. He kept in contact with his mother, every night calling her to ease and reassure the matriarch that he was fine. Mei did send him a quick message, but she had been mostly busy with her own classes and personal projects. His mother had also relayed the situation to his girlfriend, which might be playing a part as to why the mechanic had been so hard to contact recently. Which was why he after the last class for the day, Izuku was taking a train to visit Mei. It didn't take long for him to arrive at her address, the garage being converted into her personal workshop. Izuku had yet to meet Hatsume's parents, but that was something that he could worry about later. First came his first lover. The closed gate meant little to him, as he had his own key, a gift from the girl. He entered, but couldn't hear the usual sounds that normally surrounded Mei. There was no whirling machinery or running motor, and at most he could pick up the sound of her breathing, the sound labored. He immediately tracked it to the work table, finding Mei to be leaning forward, slumped over the table. She was surrounded by all the new tools he had gifted her, yet none seemed to be appealing to his girlfriend. Instead, she seemed rather preoccupied with hugging one of his hoodies, stifling sobs and whines. Stupid vampire, leaving me alone, and getting arrested in school. Her complaints were empty heedless words. No sooner had they left her mouth, Mei further dug her face into the clothing item. I miss you. He noticed that the table was full of blueprints, all of them incomplete. The bear's sketch would be visible as well as some supposed features, but it seemed that all were rather readily abandoned. Mei was hurting, and it was his fault. He punched himself for allowing it to happen. The dull sound didn't alert the girl to his presence in her workshop. He would fix that. Reaching from behind, Izuka rested his arms around Mei, the girl flinching in place. She slowly raised her head away from the hoodie and turned around to identify the source of the sudden warmth she felt. Once her sight-shaped pupils got a glimpse of the green hair, Mei immediately forgot the item and jumped on the hemomancer, gluing her body against his. Izuku. 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 She repeated it like a mantra, nuzzling and rubbing her face against his chest, as if he would disappear the moment she stopped. He hugged her harder, letting Mei have her moment to calm down. There would be time later for apologies, for now this told his intentions better than any speech she may have practiced back in his temporary room. Many tears and a string of apologies from both parties later, the vampire and the mechanic had made up. They hadn't exactly fraught, but it always nice to open up and talk about anything that might have hurt the other. One thing led to the other, and now the two were on May's bathroom, cuddling in the bathtub. He honestly expected the girl's room to be a bit messier, but it was fairly in order. Might have to do with the fact that she was barely in it most of the time, but Izuku liked to think that he managed to instill in her a few good habits. She did stop trying to constantly pull all-nighters and her eating habits were getting better. Still had to work on bluntness and social manners, but baby steps were the way to go. Also pertaining to cleanliness, Mei got that ball going on her own. She never minded motor oil and grease on her skin during work hours, but as soon as that was done she would immediately shower and clean up. She was also extra cuddly after showers, so he wasn't going to complain. Thus, they were hugging in the warm water, Mei resting up against his chest while wrapping his arms around her. That was wild. Her comment, well sort, did resonate rather well with his thoughts. Indeed. He said close to her ear, enjoying the warm sensation of her skin against his. So, when can I meet Melissa? 
Mei's enthusiastic question was met with a humming sound from the vampire's throat. She grabbed his right arm and brought it closer, examining the red bracelet resting on the vampire's wrist. I'm not sure. I Island might be closed off for visitors for a while and Shield San might not be so keen on strangers over. I will message them, but expect to wait for a fair bit. Izuku stated. Hatsume released a disappointed whine, but the vampire settled her mood by peppering her exposed neck and shoulders with tiny kisses. Her breathing picked up a bit, but he was careful to not stoke her too much. She did look back to him with needy, moist eyes, but he kept things civil. He was going to train hard to expel most of the stress from dealing with the counseling, and the constant questionings required by the HPSC, then he would get intimate with Mei. If he were to do it as he was, he might bully, and do Mei too hard. So he would resist the temptation of plucking the forbidden fruit for now. Which is why my first uniform was eventually censored, and I had to revise it to this current model. Midnight finished her lecture just as the last bell rang, signaling the end of classes for the day. She waved her students, but seemed to remember a last minute detail. They'll be darlings and stay for a bit, okay? Azawa sensei has something to talk to you. That sparked curiosity among the first year students. Izuku packed the last of his notebooks and waited. He knew that whatever his homeroom teacher had to say probably had to deal with the summer break. He and Yoyorozu had been previously called to the teacher's office to help settle a few things and Aizawa commented about a special plan for school trip. Classes 1A's and 1B's schedule was always packed full of activities, and this year was no different. There would be time for a proper one-week vacation, the common courses got the full month, but as heroes in training, they were expected to always be improving and striving to learn new skills. Aizawa soon entered the room with all the energy he was known to have. That is, he entered the room crawling, stuffed inside his yellow cocoon sleeping bag, the bags under his eyes terribly prominent, and his scruffy stubble almost to full, a still scruffy, beard. He dragged his body to the teacher's podium, and after a few audible grunts, the teacher completed his metamorphosis. Class, all your tests have been graded, both the written exams and physicals. Most of you did well and passed, although a few of you only did it by the very skin of your teeth. Aizawa commented, eyes glaring at some of the students, but keeping names to himself. He had a few papers with him, his eyes calling Izuku and Momo. The duo stood up and received the pages, noticing them to be permission forms for a prolonged school summer camp. They began to share the pages among their classmates, Aizawa continuing his piece. Midoriya and Yoyorozu are passing to you the needed authorization forms that your parents need to sign for you to be allowed to come to summer camp. Needless to say, for those that failed the exams, you. Eraser had drawled out the words, causing a growing tension inside the class. Will be allowed to join in. There was a burst of joyful cheers inside the class as Mina, Kaminari, Hiroshima, and Sarah whooped. Their festive mood was soon burst as their teacher's glare became enhanced by the shine of his quirk activating. Quite. Azawa closed his eyes for a moment, cutting the effects of his power and taking a deep breath. As I was saying. You will be allowed to join in, but you still have to take remedial classes and do a remedial written test. I need the form signed and handed in tomorrow. We will take a bus to a remote and safe location, so it is important that your parents sign the consent forms. We plan on starting summer camp next week. Izuku and Momo's job done, both took their seats. The vampire read his own copy, while the heiress raised her hand. Receiving permission to speak, the girl was quick to ask. Sensei, what do you mean by remote and safe location? Aizawa grumbled, hoping that no one actually asked anything, and let him be. Nonetheless, he answered. You all are quite aware, that Class 1 has had many unexpected brushes with danger and villains, much more so this year than any other recent. That has raised concerns with our principal Nezu, who is worried about data leaks. We won't give the villains the satisfaction of stopping us, but we have to remain focused and ready for whatever is to come. His words caused a few hushed whispers to sprout among the teens, but nothing that seemed to go over his tolerance. We won't reveal the location of our training site, and only a few selected staff members will be privy to the information, so rest easy, you will be safe with us. Racer had finished with a serious tone, his commitment and seriousness to their safety almost palpable. The teacher then unconsciously brushed the jagged scar under his right eye. If that is all. His last question had the entire class not in class. Class dismissed, with the exception of you, Midoriya and Yoyorozu. The vampire perked an eyebrow up, but obeyed, remaining in his seat. He bid his friends farewell, noticing that Yuraka had almost remained behind, lingering until Asui called out to her. Only then did the brunette reluctantly leave, waving cheerfully to the vampire. Once the class emptied out, Aizawa got their attention. He took four folders from his sleeping bag, two thick ones with class 1A printed on, while the other two had no outstanding details. I won't take long. Normally we don't ask students this, but as I said before, these are trying times, and you both have displayed both incredible analytical eyes, and a willingness to help your fellow classmates. The teacher handed the two teens a mix of the folders, each having one thick and one thin folder. 
You are not required to help out, but if you could give a few pointers in quirk development to your classmates during the summer camp, I'd appreciate it. Izuku opened his class's folder, giving it a quirk peek. Momo also took the chance to examine hers. The second one is an early assortment of student profiles that have managed to impress the teaching board enough that we considered bumping them up to the hero course. Read carefully through those if you can spare the time and do give out your opinions. Your opinions hold weight, and they might become your classmates depending on our choice and your points. Now that got Izuku's attention. He closed the previous folder, and opened the second one, noticing that it only held two student profiles. Hitashi Shinsu, Class 1C. Mineta Minor, Class 1C. The vampire remembered both from the school festival. He hummed, certainly interested in this side project. Momo looked to him, wondering how they were going to go about this. He nodded to her, both focusing on their teacher. Yes sir, we will try our best. Momo said in a chirp tone, Izuku silently agreeing with a nod. Thank you both for your efforts. You are dismissed. The duo left together, heading towards the entrance gates, while deep in thought, their silent walk a comfortable thing. It didn't take long for the class president and vice president to reach the gates, the vampire lingering a bit as he used his phone to send a few texts. His messages sent, the vampire noticed that Yoyorozu had also remained behind. Yoyorozu san. His voice got her attention, the girl's gaze settling over his frame. Anything I can help you with? Momo seemed a bit indecisive, playing with the end of her ponytail. Midoriya kun. Yes. I was talking with Jiro san the other day. She started up, slowly gathering courage for something. If Izuku were a popular kid, he'd risk saying that she was gathering her wits for a confession. In reality, however, there was no way that would be the case. Right? And we wanted to know if you could come along. He blinked, aware that his slight slip of the mind made his miss whatever the heiress had said. Sure. He agreed, observing the reactions of the girl to see if he hadn't messed anything up. Momo released a relieved sigh, offering Izuku a bright smile before she checked her own phone in her bag. Then I will text you the location and time of our meeting. The black-haired beauty was beyond happy with the vampire's agreement, going ahead of the vampire, and skipping steps almost like a young child that was promised he wondered what he was to do, considering he had just agreed to something he wasn't entirely sure what it was. Well, considering it was Yoyorozu and Kyuka who were organizing whatever this meeting was, he'd not need to worry too much. Still, now the vampire took the time to head towards Dagaba Beach, more specifically towards his gym. Togo had been quiet and very obedient so far, but considering his current circumstances, it would be better to check up on her and reinforce his orders. It was also time to fill in the stock of blood bags he usually left for her. He took the train by himself, putting his hood up to avoid much recognition. He wasn't a rising star, but his face had been plastered up a bunch in the media due to the school festival, and the vampire preferred to err on the side of caution. He didn't need to be causing public nuisances and give excuses for the noose around his neck to tighten. He lit his fangs, and spared the red bracelet around his right wrist a glance, before placing his headphones over his ears and letting the soothing sound of the rock continue. The train ride ended without any fanfare, the vampire descending the station and walking the rest of the way towards the coast. The sky had darkened a fair bit, but it was nothing that the vampire wasn't used to. If anything, he enjoyed the darker hours of the day the most, his hunter instincts best tuned for it. He arrived at the building, mentally noting that it was all in order. No trash on the way to the beach either, so Himiko was doing a proper job as on-site caretaker. He grabbed his keys and opened the front door, noticing that the gym area still had lit lights, and he could smell someone soaked in sweat. The tang of it was a bit unfamiliar, the vampire narrowing his eyes and slowing his steps, careful to hug the walls and preparing a small amount of blood in his hand. One could never be too careful. He peeked from the corner of the closest wall to the gym area, hidden. His eyes captured the sight of a very sweaty kendo, the girl lifting up heavy set of dumbbells, her top soaked and clinging to her skin. Toga was close by, disguised by a black wig and brown contact lenses, cheering the martial artist who was clearly on her last exercise. Come on Ken-chan, you can do it. Himiko cheered from her seat on one of the weight machines, clad in sports gear, yet not a drop of sweat glistened on her skin, her support of Itsuka being only her presence. Kendo sucked an air through grit teeth, feeling the straining burn in her muscles, but still pushing through to complete her set. She finally finished the exercise, placing the dumbbells on the floor before she herself collapsed on the floor, panting tiredly. Mitsuka gave out a tired glance at Toga, sweat dripping from her forehead and lightly stinging her eyes. She closed her eyelids, and took to focus on breathing, bringing sweet oxygen inside her tired lungs. Too tired to complain. She panted, leaning against one of the machines for support. I was fairly confident in my training regimen before UA, but Death Arms really does go hard at it. She commented. Kamiko was about to comment something, but noticed someone approaching. She turned her head to find out who it was, and nearly squealed in joy at the sight of her favorite person. She snapped her hands over her mouth, when she noticed the mischievous grin that was painted over Izuku's mouth, the vampire carrying with him the cold water bottle and a small towel. 
Mir Chan, could you get me some water? Itsuka pleaded, eyes still closed, her head hung low as she tried to fix her breathing. Mir smirked, but responded with a humming noise, content with staying in her place and merely watching the show that the vampire would put on. Itsuka only noticed a presence when it was just about in front of her. She tiredly extended a hand over as Mir said a here you go. But all she grasped was empty air. Not a moment after Kendo yelled, feeling the cold touch of the water bottle on her neck. Her eyes snapped open and she glared at the caretaker in front of her, only to immediately notice that Mir had never moved from her seat, the person in front of her being. Izuku, Kendo said in surprise, releasing another yelp as the cold water bottle once more touched her hot skin. Hi. Stop it. She swept the cold drink before the vampire could press it against her once more, trying her best version of a glare at the hemomancer. The green-haired teen merely waved at her, squatting down and offering a towel to the martial artist. Hello there, Kendo-san. He greeted, his smirk still splitting his lips mischievously, the vampire acting as if he had done nothing wrong. I see that you are taking your training rather seriously. I suppose the recommendation did pan out better than what you were expecting. She took the offered towel and wiped the sweat off her forehead, immediately opening the water bottle and downing just about half the contents. I can't slack off, you know. Summer camp is just around the corner, and I want to blow it out the park with Kansas Sensei. Itsuka explained, slinging the towel over her shoulders. Manama has been calling for an all-out war to show the efforts of our class, so you better watch out. He is annoying, but he can rally people up if anything else. Kendo jokingly commented. Izuka let his smile grow a bit, extending a hand to pat down the sweaty hair of the girl. Yes, yes, class 1B is good and scary too. Kendo tried to dodge and swat the vampire's hand away, but Izuku was persistent with his teasing. In the end the girl gave up, and let the green hair do as he pleased. Ken-chan is in heaven, huh? Himiko commended from the side, her voice displaying a hint of jealousy. Izuka blushed, this time putting more effort, in sweating the padding hand of the vampire. Izuka relented, but still offered a hand to the girl to help her stand up. Kendo took it and rose from the floor, pining to jet some revenge on the vampire for his teasing. There wasn't much she could do and nothing truly came to mind, so she grasped her towel and wiped more sweat from her neck. I don't think he truly enjoys being in a room with a sweaty girl. Nah, trust me, major pervert. Armpit fetishist, feed lover, sweaty girl smelling pervert. Toga spoke, making Kendo's blush increase. She let her eyes wander about, unwilling to let them settle either on the vampire or the caretaker, unsure if she should take the accusation serious or not. She trusted in the vampire, her mind still refusing to elaborate something more complex than just that, yet, she did spend little time with him, whereas Mir was the trusted caretaker of the gym, and she did seem to know the vampire a fair bit. The martial artist girl felt her internal conflict increase as Izuku did not contest the labels placed on him by the other girl. She did raise her head to try, and gauge some reaction out of the green-haired teen, noticing that he didn't seem amused at the caretaker's suggestion about his supposed hobbies. He shook his head tiredly, turning it and focusing his eyes upon her frame, scanning her features up and down a few times, making the girl shift a bit in her place. I suppose that there are worse fetishes out there to have. He said in a serious tone, making Kendo drop her jaw. She immediately turned around to leave, heading towards the female shower room in a rush, steam emerging from her head. Mira kept her eyes on Izuku, seeing him keep his orbs focused on Kendo's retreating back until she was out of sight. Izukain, you bad boy. You shouldn't play with the maiden's heart like that, you know. She might just fall in love with you. Toga spoke in her usual, lovey dovey tone, a blush dusting her features. Her current grinning smile was a perverted looking thing, but the vampire ignored it. So long as the blonde did obey him, and didn't bring in too much trouble, he could deal with her. It was far from bringing justice to the probable victims that she had attacked, but the vampire felt that the girl could still be helped. There was still something inside her that was more than just lust filled bloodthirst. He was going about it with baby steps, seeing as he wasn't exactly a paragon of justice himself. That sort of title and mince it could be left to someone more, naive. But then again, he was doing this, so maybe he didn't have the high ground to be calling. He rolled his eyes at her words, and shoot her back to her post. He went to his own office, and took off his school coat, placing it over the desk and rolling his shirt sleeves back. The vampire gathered some rubbing alcohol from a med kit, and spent some time cleaning both his hands and arms. He could simply just command some blood out of his skin pores, and pour it inside some of the used blood bags that he had in his office, but since he had some time to spare, he went about it the long way. He was in no hurry, Himiko would lock everything up after Kendo left and would head to the office too, likely aware that he was draining some blood for her. Whenever it came to his life fluid, she would turn into some sort of land shark, dropping anything that she might be doing to observe the process and feed as soon as she could. Izuku understood the feeling very well. The way that the thirst could be maddening, whispers of your darkest desires calling for their nourishment. Blood drinkers normally wouldn't struggle this hard with acquiring their especially needed sustenance, as the government did provide some assistance to their cause. 
the old vigilant black blood and the super villain corn being the main representatives for changes in the way that blood drinkers were seen during the old cork wars and during the beginning of the silver age of heroes however cases like Izuku's were even more limited and thus far more troublesome animal blood did not have the same kick that human blood did for him trust him he did try when young to keep to a diet of animal blood along with his meals but it wasn't the same there was still social stigma upon blood drinkers but then again no society was perfect Izuku could try to influence it further, when he was out of hot waters, and when his word had more backing. For now, he contented with doing, whatever he was capable of, which at this moment was this. Feeding Himiko was also a sort of test, to see if his blood would have some sort of adverse effect or any other effect for that matter without his input. He would also have to contact Melissa soon, to see if she was feeling any sort of unusual side effects. David hadn't reported anything in his emails, but then again, he had seen Izuku sink his fangs into his daughter's neck, even if for a good cause. The vampire shook his head to clean his mind of the maelstrom of thoughts and relaxed on his chair, opening one of the drawers to grab a kit of disposable needles, syringes and plastic tubbing, as well as brand new and empty plastic blood bags. He did the entire process of inserting the needle into his flesh with practice ease, the sting of the metal in his vein, barely registering as the pulled lightly on his power, and began to push blood out. He also fished his phone out of his pocket and connected to his headphones, this time opting for some jazz. Himiko arrived just as he finished filling up the second blood bag, the girl tossing her wig on the nearby coffee table, and tossing herself over the couch, lazily occupying the entirety of the furniture like a needy cat. They remained in silence for a while, Izuka content with listening to the music play out in his headphones, while Toga observed the blood bags being filled up much like a child would be entranced by the sight of factory machines making candy. She kicked her legs up and down, humming to herself and letting a Cheshire grin split her lips, showing her fangs. The next week also flew by fast. The only development that truly stood out from the usual for the vampire, was that his beachfront house was finally fully refurbished. Shame that he was still essentially living in his UA provided temporary quarters, but Izuku figured that it was best that he was patient with this sort of thing, wouldn't want to be throwing mud on the HPSC, and have them chomping at the bit to slap him with further restrictions, and god knows what else. He had had countless psyche evaluations with Hound Dog, all visits supervised by Racerhead, and a new suit that the government had sent to check up on the situation, and assured that UA wasn't skipping on any formalities. His freedom had been somewhat restricted. That meant no more night strolls for now, no naughty visits for May, and no court practice that wasn't strictly being overlooked by a teacher. Still, it was a miracle that his personal properties were spared from invasive searches. The vampire wasn't so foolish as to believe that such thing was an oversight by the HPSC. And it was more likely that Aizawa and Principal Nezu had pulled some strings and strong-armed some arguments to get his privacy to remain private. That shot surely had helped too, so the vampire tallied in his heart a few points towards them, promising to pay them back for their respect and trust. Still, he told Himiko to remain careful, and not expose herself needlessly. One count of murder was enough trouble as it was, he didn't need the government aware of the villain-turned-pet gym caretaker nonsense that was going on. Hero training classes had also eased up somewhat, which caused the vampire to grow rather suspicious of whatever it was that Aizawa was planning. Don't get him wrong, the teen had newly found deep appreciation for his homeroom teacher. The man did care much more than he let on under the facade of gruff and sarcasm, but he was still willing to put them through the absolute trainer, if it meant they would become better heroes. Thus, it made little sense for their teacher to ease up on their training schedule, unless he was cooking up something truly sadistic. The vampire kept his musings in his mind for the moment, unwilling to spoil the somewhat festive mood of class 1A, maybe he was getting too paranoid with the recent happenings. Class had ended not too long ago, and the vampire was quick to pack his things and leave. Friday night had been the selected day for the outing with Yoyorozu and Kiyoka, a little friendly date for the group to relax and have some fun before the summer camp. He had cleared with Jiro the misunderstanding that Momo had caused with her behavior, the rocker laughing for a full minute as he explained what led to his line of thought. He would get a little payback today, as his own mood hadn't been the best recently. He returned to his temporary quarters, and placed all his school-related items away, and took a quick shower. His choice of clothing for today was fully casual. His usual red sneakers, black jeans with a simple belt, and a combo of an open, red checkered flannel shirt with an black inner t-shirt with the white kanji characters for casual shirt written in a bold font right in the middle of his chest. Yes, he enjoyed punch shirts, it was not a sin to enjoy cum comedy. He grabbed his wallet and phone and sent a text to his teacher, along with keeping the location tracking function of his phone turned on. It was another one of the requirements placed on him, that his location be known all times until further notice. He left school grounds and headed to the closest train station. The vampire checked with the Kyoka for the location of their meeting spot, receiving a message that merely said, Heroin Karyuk Bar, West Kamuracho District. A quick peek at the location on the provided map, and he took the train to head there. 
Jiro was aware that he wasn't one for loudness, unless it was necessary, but he trusted her. Well he supposed that while the name was gaudy, it should be a fairly quiet and cozy place. Judgment, Shinpan. Wow, breaking the law. Breaking the world. Of course. Hiroshima shouted sang into his microphone rather passionately, Denki by his side sporting a tambourine, and trying to not beat it too out of rhythm. Izuku observed the enthusiastic singing from the farthest seat available in the booth that Yoirozu had rented for them. He did shake his head along with the song, certainly having fun. Izuku had arrived at the carrot just on time to meet with the girls, but noticed that it was not only them, but a small group composed of Kaminari, Hiroshima, Sero, Ashido, and Toru added to their group. The vampire wasn't disappointed, but his interactions with many of them had been limited. Tokoyami had been invited too, but he ended up busy with something else. Still, everyone received him well. Supposedly the outing was to be sooner in the day to allow the peeps to buy anything that they needed before heading out for the summer camp, but the timing ended up not allowing for much shopping. Mina then came with the idea of a friendly group date among friends, to allow the group a small respite, before they were whisked to god knows where. Aizawa's sensei was tight-lipped about the whole affair, not willing to give out the tiniest bit of info. That left the social butterfly and queen of gossip bitter, and so she decided to put her efforts into something more productive and fun. Once she approached Momo, the heiress ended up revealing she had her own plans to go out, and then the acid cork user bugged the taller girl until they merged their groups, and thus all of that led to their current moment. Hiroshima finished his song with the air guitar riff, somehow ending up with a red tie wrapped around his forehead. A round of applause echoed in their private room, Doridi placing his microphone on the juka box, and returning to his seat under the ovation of his classmates, grabbing a can of soda to quench his thirst and manly spirit. There was a bit of fanfare among the group to see whose turn would be, Izuka content on letting it play out. He was not a great singer, so he would enjoy the show and avoid any embarrassment. Or so was his plan, but he could see Kyoko looking his way with a cheeky grin and evil intending eyes. He saw her stand up from her seat beside Momo and make her way to the juka box, surely intending on picking something extremely hard to sing to. That, or she could simply be in the mood for some singing, but he knew her fairly well to know that she wasn't one to be under the spotlight too if not needed. Deciding against betting on future odds, and the goodwill of the rocker, the vampire stood from his seat and approached the juka box too, intent on picking whatever anime song was currently most popular. Maybe he should opt for the Mahu Shoujo genre. His sadistic streak fancied something extremely girly and cute, just to see Kyoka squirm while singing that. He did cheat a bit, using Blink to appear right before the girl and hold her wrist before she could touch the screen of the juka box and decide his fate. Kyoka grabbed the microphone and tried to put her current choice in, but the vampire was ahead of her game, and did hold the other wrist too. The duo remained in a strength bout lock for a few minutes, each trying to press the song of their choice to see the other squirm a bit. They failed to notice that their shenanigans got the attention of the remaining group, the classmates observing the vampire and the rocker measure strength, and will to embarrass the other. Oh, Mina like it. The pink-skinned girl teased on her end, a smug grin painted over her lips, the girl not even bothering to hide it. The two of you look so cute. She teased, getting the two to stand still in their struggle. Izuku slowly released his hold on Jiro's wrists, the rocker grumbling, and lowering her head. Truce. He asked, looking to the side, a bit embarrassed. Kyoka nodded. Truce. And then, Izuku's hand hovered over the screen of the musical device, choosing his song. Discotek Nana Mizuki Rosario plus Vampire Kapu OP2. Kyoka's stunned look was then captured by all their classmates, Mina, being the most devious one, immediately taking a picture in her phone. Oh you little shit. Izuku shrugged his shoulders, pointing to the rocker. You got the mic, the music is on, you've got to sing now. He said while returning to his seat, but not before turning to the rocker once more. Disco lady. He said in English, the teasing, smug, shit-eating grin he was sporting making the rocker swear a thousand years of revenge upon the vampire. If she was blushing, that was a lie, and the AC in the room wasn't working properly. The following day was rather easy going for class 1A. They arrived in school with their packed bags, stored the items inside their bus, and took off from campus, Aizawa being the only teacher with them. Izuku was sure that their sister class was supposed to be with them, so their absence raised a few alarms in his head. He had asked Kendo during one of their lunch breaks about how their first day went, and needless to say, it was a far cry from the Spartan, borderline inside methods, that the erasure hero had employed. The ride in the bus took a while, the vampire losing track of any city limits about 45 minutes into their trip. The students had arrived early in campus, the screen of his phone now accusing 9.27 in the morning, the blue sky a pleasant vision to accompany him. It took about another 20 minutes for the bus to stop atop a high cliff, giving the students the sight of a great forest area. Everyone vacated the vehicle, and took a rain check, to spread their legs and breath in some air, wondering why the sudden stop. This feels strange. The tired mentor would not stop for nothing. Careful master, this is suspicious. 
The vampire agreed to the buzzing in his mind, scanning his surroundings to see if this was some sort of test for the group. Momo, ever the polite lady, raised a hand, before asking her question. Aizawa sensei, why have we stopped here? Where is our lodging, and the training site? All valid questions that one could, and honestly should, ask their appointed homeroom teacher. Aizawa hadn't gotten far from the bus, hands stuffed inside his pockets, and sporting the usual deadpan gaze one were to expect from him. He looked like he couldn't be bothered to think up of a reason for their stop, so eventually the teacher merely shrugged his shoulders. That would be because of us. A cheerful female voice rang in Izuku's head, the vampire doubling his efforts in the search for nearby presences. Finally something entered his range of detection, the vampire's head snapping towards the top of the class's bus. Atop the bus two people stood, the sun's light shining at just the right angle that it made the two people remain only shadowy silhouettes as they pose. They pose. Izuku narrowed his eyes for a moment, but soon recognized the ladies atop the bus. Well, it wouldn't take a hero nerd to recognize the frilly, cat-themed suits that belonged to two members of the four members of the well-known Difficult Terrain Rescue Squad, also known as the Wild, Wild Pussycats. If he wasn't mistaken, the voice that rang in his head belonged to the recognized leader of the group, Mandalay the mindful Nako hero. Which meant that next to her, in the light blue-colored, frilly costume stood the young Nako hero, Pixie Bob. Look at this, Aizawa's litter is full of bright kittens. The blonde, cat-themed heroine exclaimed, posing her hands akin to the movements of a cat, the giant cat gloves also aiding in the endeavor. The homeroom teacher could do without the cat-centered talk or the hidden implications Ryuko enjoyed sprinkling in her conversations. Nonetheless, after holding back a pain groan, the man spoke up. Now pay attention. This summer camp has the objective of not only preparing all of you to handle the intense situations and challenges that are being thrown your way, but it is also a preparation to aid your efforts in earning early provisional hero licenses. During your internships, quirk usage was only permitted when around, or when explicitly allowed by your mentor hero. Provisional licenses will allow you to bypass that restriction, within reason of course, and allow you to experience the true hero routine without any troubles with the law. As always spoke with a firm tone, his words resonating with his students, and with one blood drinker in particular. That the underground hero seemed to focus his gaze on the vampire, further made him respect the pro. Had Aizawa pushed for this aid the vampire or was it a consequence of their current times? Whatever the case it be, the vampire steeled his resolve, promising to himself to ace this training, and earn his provisional license. Your training will be aided by the wild wild pussycats. They have volunteered to help you, going so far as to offer their personal land to aid in your training efforts. The hero paused, letting the news sink in, and giving the chance to let the children over gratitudes to the group. Their gratitude wouldn't last long anyway, so it was best they did it now, while their hearts were still full of kindness. With that been said, I'll let them take it from here. He finished his piece, turning his back on the students, and slowly making his way to the bus. Hmm, Aizawa sensei. Yida was the one to ask, stiffly raising his hand for his question. The racer had merely turned his head, only giving the teen inside eyes worth of attention. Izuku wasn't sure why, but the inner beast was sending warning, after warning in his head, although the vampire was sure, that the area clear of living threats. I'm sure that all of us are very thankful for the praiseworthy actions of the wild wild pussycats, sir. Tania spoke, fixing his glasses in place and robotically pointing towards the bus. But you still haven't answered our question, sir. Aizawa sighed in frustration. Or so it seemed to be, but when he fully turned around to face his class, the man was sporting a smile. That same creepy grin that he used during their first test. Did I say summer camp? I meant to say, his words stunned the students. Training camp. And training camp starts now. Pixie Bob shouted, jumping from her perch atop the bus, and slamming her cat gloves on the ground, the dirt beneath her moving impossibly fluid. The earth moved akin to water, the waves coming towards the students like a tsunami intent on washing them down the cliff. Izuku jumped over the incoming wave, ready to blink to the safety of the us. Shadow matter also began to sprout from his back like tails, the dark tendrils aiming to grab whoever was closest to him. Watch out. The warning came at just the right moment for the teen, allowing him to cross his arms and mount a defense against the incoming cat glove of Mandalay, her smile a refreshed thing. Izuku hissed, the woman's blow heavier than he expected, but still manageable. He was about to counter with a lashing kick in a tentacle of blood, but warning roars echoed in his mind again. Incoming. Pixie Bob came to the aid of her fellow cat hero, slamming a glove into his torso, and making the vampire release a grunt. He still held on, the trio now falling under the effects of gravity onto the ground bellow. Or so that would happen, but there was a saying that went like this. Third time is the charm. Cat toss. A deep-toned, male voice echoed from among the trees in the cliff behind the bus. That was fine, but the massive gloved hand that clamped around his face wasn't. Izuku could increase his brain's processing power many-fold, and essentially enter a slow-motion world capable of allowing him to at least predict a bullet's trajectory, 
which now seemed to mean nothing, as he felt powerful fingers clench around his face, and a third palm slammed against the fence, breaking through. Then, he understood why this move was called cat toss. He was hurled along the cliff, his classmates no doubt waiting for him at the bottom of it. Boy, that kitten sure is eager. The blonde heroine exclaimed, a smile across her lips. Aizawa nodded, returning to the bus. But he is. Hmm, do you think that I could? Before Ryuko could complete her sentence, Mandalay face palmed inside. No, Ryuko please. The kid is a minor. I'm forever young, Mandy chan I don't feel a day over 18. The blonde said in a cheerful tone, but the more attentive heroes did notice a dark horror emerging from the heroine. Forever young. I did not age a day. The heroine spoke aloud, trying to convince herself more than the her fellow heroes. Mandalay ignored the blonde squatting down, and drawing circles on the dirt. She turned to her fellow group member, a massive and muscular tan man, who was also wearing the cat-themed costume of the group, complete with cat ears and frilly skirt. So, Tiger, how long do you think, that they will take to reach camp? The man crossed his arms in a pensive pose. Hmm, a bit hard to say. Eraserhead did say to increase the challenge, so if they are very lucky or very skilled, they might reach the lodge by him. Tiger took a few more moments to ponder. Considering that they hadn't even told the kids where the lodge was, and merely tossed them over the cliff without many explanations, then. About 8 in the evening. Mandalay nodded her head. Oi, Ryuko, cheer up. You get to cook for the kids. Maybe Vampire Kun might notice you. Sasaki Shino, i.e. Mandalay, joked. Ryuko perked up from her self-imposed depressive mood. Only to fall into it again as she noticed it to be a joke. But then again, she could. While Pixie Bob was with her head in the clouds, Mandalay approached the cliff and focused, pulling on her telepathy. She decided to throw the kids a bone, else she was sure they would be too demoralized by their situation. Get through the forest dear kittens, and you might just make it in time for lunch. And do be careful. Our lands are famed for their mystical creatures. Some say they are an earthly attraction. She relayed the message in a white area, sure to display her feelings hoping for their success. She enjoyed being kind too, you know. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want a next part of this video, like subscribe, and comment down below, and turn on that bell notification, and also check out the other videos that I have created, and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.